So you've decided to stop net decking and want to start deck building in Star Wars Unlimited. Well, you've come to the right place, but there's a problem. Getting into a competitive trading card game and succeeding at deck building involves dealing with a complete minefield of esoteric vocabulary. You've probably heard these terms thrown around a lot and quite often misused, probably by me. Terms like tempo, curve, aggro, value, mid-range, card advantage, control. These terms make up the bedrock of a competitive trading card game. Sure, you can just throw 50 cards together into a deck and that might be enough for you in casual play, or you can just make a theme deck and have fun with it. But if you want to play in and win tournaments, you're going to need to choose a style of play. You're going to need to pick the right cards to match your style, and you're going to need to make sure you have a good curve which allows you to maximize your chances of winning. So without further ado, welcome to Deck Building 101. You might think the first step is to choose a leader and a base. The first step is to choose a style of play, because this will inform everything we do going forwards. Do you want to play aggro, mid-range, or control? A quick side note, currently in Star Wars Unlimited the card pool is quite limited, and so while you can push a deck down one of these routes, they're not the perfect examples of that style. But we have to work with what we've got. So let's define each of these styles of play and run through the traits of each one. Starting with aggro. Aggro is exactly as it sounds. The aim is to be aggressive. Flood the board with small units and race your opponent's base down from 30 or 25 to zero as fast as possible. Aggro often depends on a fast tempo rather than card advantage and value. And if left unchecked by your opponent, aggro can quickly overwhelm. What do we mean when we talk about tempo? Tempo means both the speed at which you play the game and the efficiency of your actions whilst playing. If you're playing multiple units on curve effectively and you're efficiently using your resources, you can be said to have good tempo. Aggro decks often have synergies to make their cheap units go further by trading two for one or by increasing their damage on the base, further increasing their tempo. Good deck examples of aggro include Sabine and Leia. Examples of strong aggro cards include Sabine the Unit and Rally and Cry, the double red event which gives all your units raid two this phase. Both of these decks have synergies which mean that whilst their individual units are weak, when played together they become something stronger and can overwhelm their opponent. You should play aggro if you like to play fast, if you enjoy the feeling of overwhelming your opponent quickly, and if you like to be doing something every turn. Playing aggro well is quite difficult, as it's a balance of knowing when to commit your resources, when to hold back in expectation of removal, and playing to your out. By this I mean making a play based on what you might draw next, which is quite a difficult skill to master, and requires you to know your deck inside out. Next up we have control. Once again the name is kind of on the tin here. Control decks want to control the battlefield, and to play the long game. They attempt to slow everything down through attrition and removal. As the game progresses, they take advantage of their more expensive powerful cards to destroy the opponent. Where tempo is key for aggro decks, card advantage is what control players are looking to gain. What do we mean by card advantage? It simply means you have more cards and therefore more options than your opponent. Value and card advantage can also be obtained by using cards which generate other cards, either through card draw, token generation, or through something called tutoring which just means to search your deck for specific cards and draw them to your hand. Virtual card advantage can also be obtained by not playing out your threats in the early game, and by not being proactive, and taking a more conservative approach. A good example of this, and this is a really key point, so listen carefully, is a good technique to play control against Bobber Green. Bobber Green wants to play down Super Laser Tech into the ground arena, and run it into something with Energy Conversion Lab. A good control player would recognize this and not play down their cheap units in the ground arena in the early game, preventing the bobber player from enacting their plan. Control decks have multiple ways to enact their own plan. Control decks gain card advantage by answering multiple threats with one event, something like Overwhelming Barrage or Super Laser Blast, stopping expensive threats with cheaper spells like Force Throw, and drawing multiple cards or forcing the opponent to discard multiple cards with one event. Even if a control deck can't deal with every threat on the board, they can leave out whichever ones stand poorly on their own. For example, removing red 3 to remove the raid effect from all of the other rebel units. You should play a control deck if you like to mess with your opponent, if you like playing all the big fancy expensive cards like Devastator and Avenger, or if you just like to cause people pain and suffering and you want your opponent to slowly die inside. Next up we have mid-range decks. In mid-range decks, the aim is to play on curve throughout the game, always efficiently using your resources, ramping in the early game and then playing a few big hitters in the mid to late game, around turns 4 to 6, to overwhelm your opponent. Mid-range decks are unique in that they can be quite versatile if built correctly. You can assume the role of an aggro player against control, and you can be more control against aggro. Therefore, mid-range decks tend to do well early on in the meta, when there's a smaller card pool and decks are less refined. Kind of what we're seeing with Boba Green at the moment. A lot of the decks that are being played in Star Wars Unlimited at the moment kind of fall into the mid-range category, just because we don't have great aggro and control cards, so these decks are much less well defined. Okay, so now you've got an idea of what type of deck you want to play. The next step is to pick a leader and a base. 
generally the different leaders lend themselves to different styles of play. This is obviously a generalization and it's personal preference. So if you want to, you can try and play an aggro deck with Emperor Palpatine. It just won't be optimal. So I've grouped the leaders into which kind of deck they suit the most. So in the aggro section, I've gone for Sabine, Leia, IG-88 and Tarkin. Let's start going through the aggro leaders first. Sabine is the archetypal aggro leader. She comes down on turn 3 as a 2-5. She comes out earlier than every other leader in the game, meaning that you're moving faster than your opponent. Her ability allows her to deal a damage to the enemy base and your own base, which allows you to nuke down your opponent faster. You really don't care about your own base when racing down your opponent. She's the best example we have of an aggro leader in the game at the moment. Next up is Leia. If Sabine is the best example of an aggro leader, Leia is a close second. She comes down on turn 4 as a 3-6, and she allows you to attack with two units in one go, which is great for aggro decks as they want to move faster than the opponent, and this allows them to gain tempo and claim the initiative. Next up is IG-88, who is one of the weaker leaders in the game, but he's definitely built around an aggro game plan. He comes down on turn 4 as a 5-4, so he has really bad health but really high attack for a leader. The only other leader with 5 attack is Darth Vader. His ability as a leader lets you attack with a unit that gets plus 1 if you have more units in play than your opponent. This is obviously suited to an aggro strategy where you're going to be flooding the board early and are therefore likely to have more units than your opponent. When deployed he gives all friendly units raid 1, which again is really suited to an aggressive game plan. This ability is actually really strong. I think if IG's stats were just switched around and he was a 4-5, he'd be much higher on tier lists and be, and be a sort of more played leader, but as it stands he's, he's just too fragile, he's a glass cannon basically. Next up is Tarkin, who comes down on turn 4 as a 2-7 with the ability to uh, give an experience token to a, an Imperial unit. He can be used in aggro or mid-range. With Tarkin you're playing lots of small things and buffing them with his ability, so he's not an archetypal aggro card but he can be used in this way. Lastly we've got Cassian, who like Tarkin can be used in aggro or mid-range. He comes down late for an aggro card on turn 5 as a 4-6. The reason I've put him in aggro is that his ability is all about dealing damage to the base and drawing cards. This can be quite powerful in aggro, as obviously you're going to be trying to deal as much damage to the base as possible. And the cards that you draw with the Cassian, you can play them out as you draw them because they're so cheap. He's not the best aggro leader, but I think he does have some potential. Next we're going to discuss the control leaders. And I've gone in this list for Krennic, Aiden, Palpatine, Vader and Thrawn. I'm going to discuss Krennic and Aiden Versio together, because they're so similar. They're both, they both essentially offer the same thing. They both offer healing, with Aiden it's a passive ability. When an opponent's unit leaves play, you can exhaust her and heal one from your base. And with Krennic he has restored two when he comes down. Both of them give you access to powerful removal and late game options in Blue Villain, and both of them will heal you for an average of 4-5 to five damage a game. Krennic's passive ability gives all damaged units plus one attack, which is very strong simply by virtue of being passive. So they're both really good control leaders with, for the healing they give you and for the access they give you to the colour blue. Next up is Palpatine. Palpatine comes down on turn 7 as a 410 with an ability which says pay 1, defeat a friendly unit, deal 1 damage to a unit and draw a card. And then when he comes down as a unit you can take over a damaged non-leader unit off your opponent. The reason he's suited to control is simply because he comes down so late in the game. He's the latest leader actually. So to make it worthwhile playing him you need some kind of strategy to ramp and you need some kind of strategy to delay the game just to make it that far. But once he comes down, he's very powerful, probably the most powerful leader in the game. So he's a big payoff, which is kind of how control decks want to operate. He also gives you access to green, which gives you natural access to ramp. And then you can compare him with either red or blue, depending on how much of control you want to go down. I think paired with blue, Palpatine is a very strong uh, control deck, but no one seems to be playing that right now. Next up is Vader. Vader comes down on turn 6 as a 5-8 with an ability which says pay 1, deal 1 damage to a unit and 1 to a base. And then when he's a unit, he can deal 2 damage to another unit on attack. So Vader is very much a mid-range or control card. Like Palpatine, he comes down very late, and so you need to make it to make him worthwhile, basically. His colour combination options uh, mean he's also a good fit for control, having natural access to a lot of good removal and store cards, and you can either pair him with green to get things like overwhelming garage and ramp, or you can pair him with blue to get more powerful single target removal. Next up we have Thrawn, who comes down as a turn 5. 3-9, so he has really high health, quite difficult to get rid of. His ability lets him look at the top card of each deck, and then he can reveal one and exhaust a unit that costs the same or less than the real card. So Thrawn is in a very interesting spot. He's got a very strong control ability to let him delay his opponent, but his colour is yellow, which lacks access to some of the most powerful late game cards. So it's really difficult to pair him, because whatever colour you choose, you're going to miss out on something. If you choose to pair him with blue, 
you get some good single target removal and some very powerful late game cards like Avenger and the uh, at, at but you miss out on Ramp and Overwhelming Barrage, which are two of the st strongest things in the game. If you choose green, you miss out on good single target removal and some powerful late game bombs, but you get the Ramp package. So overall, Thrawn is a really good control card, but currently as it stands, there's not enough in the yellow villain pool to make him one of the top tier decks. Now for the mid-range decks, I'm just gonna consolidate this into one large chunk. All of the leaders in the game, with the exception of maybe Sabine, can be played as a mid-range deck. And all of the leaders left that I haven't discussed yet now, the ones that are showing, don't have stats or abilities which push them in one direction towards control or one direction towards aggro. And so I've kind of lumped them together in this mid-range section. I've also put Vader back in here because he is in one of the best mid-range decks in the game currently. So you'll notice that a lot of the leaders on this list, Boba, Vader, Han, Luke, are in some of the best decks in the game. And I think that's because we have a limited card pool and we have a limited scope to make strong aggro and control decks. And so mid-range decks are kind of dominating the meta right now. Now, like I said, this list isn't definitive. Quite a few of these leaders you can take one way or another, aggro or mid-range, mid-range or control, for example. But in general, the things I've described to you are probably the most efficient way to use these leaders. Next up is choosing a base, which means choosing a color combination. You need to choose a color that complements what you're trying to do. And so for this, you need to look at what each color is good at. Look at the card pool, find the best cards for your game plan. For example, if you're choosing to do a pure control list with someone like Darth Vader, you might want to consider running him alongside a blue base because there are some really powerful removal events in blue like Vanquish, Takedown and Super Laser Blast. Next up, we have to discuss the curve. So when you're building your deck, you need to build a deck with a good curve. And building a deck with a good curve is a skill necessary in nearly all trading card games. But what do we mean when we talk about the curve? Having a deck with a good curve simply means there's a good distribution of cards with different costs in your deck so that we can play out on curve. That means to play cards each turn that spend all or most of our resources. It doesn't mean we have the same number of cards at each cost point throughout the deck because it's going to vary with the style of deck that you're going to use, aggro, mid-range or control. When putting together your deck and your curve, you need to think about what each turn is going to look like. Build it based on what we've discussed already, what type of deck you're going to play, and look at cards that synergize well together. Identify cards in your aspects which help your game plan. For example, if you're building a blue control list, as we discussed, you're going to need good removal. So Vanquish and Takedown, whilst feeling horribly inefficient, are some of the best single target removal cards we have in the game. When playing your deck, you're going to want consistency. You're going to want to know how likely you are to draw a card that you need. To that end, it's usually better to play three copies of cards, unless you know they're extremely situational or extremely expensive, in which case you might want to play uh, two or even one copy of something. That leads us on to our next point. Once you've built your deck, try and learn it inside out, because when you're playing, you want to be able to tailor your gameplay based on what you might draw next. This is called knowing your outs or playing to your outs, and quite often the difference between winning and losing a game. I want to finish this video with a short discussion on theme. Theme is something that's not really taken into consideration in competitive play but it's a concept which is important and is one of the ways to have fun with trading card games. And isn't that really why we play the game in the first place? Our base level theme is about the game feeling like its IP, which in this instance is Star Wars. I actually think that Unlimited has some really great thematic elements. Some of my favorites being Han and Greedo. Han's ability to shoot first when he comes down with ambush, and also there being an event with uh, Han on the picture called shoot first, and Greedo getting to shoot second and take someone on the way out feel very thematic. Putting together a theme deck can be really fun, and sometimes, despite being quite janky, you can still manage to eke out a few wins along the way. So there you have it. Those are my tips on becoming a better deck builder. Just some beginner tips, really. If you have any recommendations of things you want me to cover on Star Wars Unlimited, let me know in the comments. And thanks for watching.